and operate the system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, high accuracy using deep learning, we see 96, 97% accuracy rate, and then it's race and environments customizable. Let's say the software doesn't do well in some part of uh, Asia or Africa, then we just go ahead and collect some data set, uh, train the algorithm the same way, within weeks we can have an increase in accuracy. Same thing for environment, if we're doing this for automotive, I'm gonna talk about automotive in a little bit, then um, um, you know, each car is different, uh, based on space, lighting, uh, positioning of the camera, you know, top down or down to, to bottom, um, down, down to top uh, 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 or bottom up approach or whatever the case it is. Form HMI, human machine interface, very important, which is basically the way people interact with their phone, right? If you're using your phone. Um, you can think about um, phones, tablets, wearables, TVs, computers, Cameras, security cameras, automotive, um, gaming consoles, right? Drones, robots, any and every camera enabled device can use our software or our software can be embedded in the back of that camera to process information in real time without necessarily um, you know, relying on, on, uh, on cloud processing. Uh, one of the applications that we're, um, we're very much focused on uh, for various, various reasons, which is driver monitoring. So we work with a number of car companies today because the future car, we're going to see this uh, starting the third quarter, 2017, uh, uh, is going to have a camera that's looking towards the driver to detect whether you're sleeping, your eyes are blinking, whether you're paying attention or not, and then the car will react accordingly, right? We have a quick video um, to play. I'm gonna show you how this works. The eyes may works. be the windows to the soul, but in the case of the Lexus LS, which eyes? Eyes that pivot with the road? That can see what light misses? Eyes designed to warn when yours wander? Right here. This is the applicability of our technology in a car. This is the commercial running today in the US. It's a very high-end Lexus, but it's a good start. They don't sell too much of it, but it's a very good start, right? The second application is, I mentioned earlier, robotics. There is a very popular social robot now in the US and everywhere else in, in Asia, about at least five companies that I know of that are working on this, something that will replace the phone at home. Basically, when you go home, you're not gonna use your phone, you're just gonna use a social robot. It's a tabletop robot the size of this um, little bottle. Um, that basically can do everything for you. It can listen to you, can uh, respond to commands, can take pictures, um, that is connected to the home, that does a lot of things. We have another video to play. Go ahead, Nofo, please. Jibo is the world's first consumer social robot for the home. And right now we're in phases of development production. He can take photos, he can take videos, and he can track your face and recognize you. The core feature of Jibo is individual identification. So Jibo starts to begin building a user model for each family member. Facial recognition is absolutely key to our relationship with NVIDIA and our reliance on the TK1. Jibo has the ability to learn with its AI programming. It relates to you by communicating and expressing itself using natural, social, and emotive cues so you understand each other that much better. Oh, your house in. <laughs> hey, where'd you go? There you are. Good night, Jibo. Very cool. About a $750 product. It's already in pre-orders. Um, they will be delivering the first batch, which basically was ordered about uh, eight, nine months ago, or even more, uh, sometime in 2016. So uh, this gives you an idea about where the technology can share that video with thousands of people, panelists. Anwar knows best about this, from Veilings. And basically, these people will just um, click play as if they click play on a YouTube video, right? But then they're going to be prompted to allow their camera to look at their face 
the camera that's on their laptop typically, and then watch the video naturally, right? Um, what generally happens is uh, the second they turn that camera on, the software in the background starts analyzing their facial micro-expressions, their gender, their age group. There's also other um, variables and things that we collect, such as geolocation and things like that, so we can provide great um, um, analytics. So the, the, the idea here is to tell the content creator that second 15 of the 30 second TV commercial provoked um, a smile among the male audience, um, provoked nothing among the female audience that's in New York. However, the female audience that's in Texas did find it to be interesting and it provoked also a smile or a surprise or a disgust or whatever the emotion is. Things and insight that they have never uh, seen before, right? And all of this on a dime. On a, you know, we can put together a, a campaign in less than 24 hours and uh, it would cost them about a tenth of what a focus group basically would cost them, right? Same thing goes for studios, movie production companies, trailers. There's tons and tons and tons of videos that are being uploaded to YouTube every single day. Um, and so uh, either they are not tested or they are tested poorly. Um, if you go on, I can't go back, right? Okay, so this is basically kind of a dashboard. It's a mini dashboard that you can go ahead and try on iris.com. This is a TV commercial that did really well. It's a poopery, if anybody knows about this. But it's pretty hilarious. Um, three integration solutions, mobile SDK, desktop SDK, and then uh, uh, cloud API for any developer or anybody that's interested in working on uh, or building something with this platform. Um, and, that lets, uh, and that lets me uh, uh, segue into ambient, in, ambient intelligence, right? Uh, ambient intelligence is keyword for the next decade, which basically refers to electronic environments that are sensitive and responsive to users or to the user's behavior, right? Or to the presence, presence of people. Uh, that is based on what we call sensor fusion. So you have cameras, that's one sensor. Uh, you can have, for example, heart rate monitoring. You can have um, um, motion. You can have all kinds of sensors. And these things can passively, in the background, without you knowing or seeing them, can respond accordingly and make your life a lot easier. Imagine you go home, before you walk home, your car knows your body temperature, therefore it sends a signal to your home, your home knows exactly whether you're cold or not, and it adjusts the temperature 15 minutes before you get home so you can find the comforts that you're looking for. That's the kind of ambient intelligence that I'm talking about. This is exactly what we're gonna see uh, within the next 10 years, okay? That's just one example. Um, Obviously, ambient intelligence will lead into something big, the fourth industrial revolution or era. Some people call it the AI era, the artificial intelligence era, right? Um, we hear a lot about artificial intelligence, and um, the reality is um, it's only artificial at the beginning because um, after that it becomes, it becomes the norm. It becomes, you know, it gets, uh, it fades into the fabric of life. Today there are three types of AIs. The AI that you guys know um, or knew for the last probably 10 years, which is artificial narrow intelligence. Single threaded tasks where a computer can perfect something and something and one thing only. Take, for example, a computer that beats a chess player every single time, but that's about the only single thing that that computer can do. Single threaded, artificial, narrow intelligence. Second thing is artificial general intelligence, which is the um, artificial intelligence that we know. Basically, it is kind of uh, at the same level of the human intelligence today. It's, uh, it's what, op you know, what operates your phones and your 
laptops and your devices and some of the cars and some of the smart homes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then we're moving more towards artificial super intelligence. And 2016 looks like it's moving more and more towards this. This is based on Fa uh, Frost and Sullivan, uh, um, uh, um, kind of a report that they just uh, came out with last December, which they sent me like the, uh, the, the executive summary of um, after participating at some panel with them. But this is exactly what we're, what we're going towards. This is exactly what we're going to see in the, next, um, in the next decade or so, right? So artificial super intelligence, which basically beats the human's understanding, beats the human intelligence. And that's what you hear sometimes uh, people say, uh, you know, robots will overtake the world and the machine will basically just start killing people and all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, some people call it life 2.0, um, obviously because of a number of things. We're going to talk about the, 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 uh, the picture on the top left corner, which is the mobility revolution. It's going to cover everything here. So the mobility revolution is based on... Uh, um, a good friend of mine called Lucas Neckerman wrote a book called The Triple Zero. Um, he's out of London. And The Triple Zero basically um, stands for zero. Anybody has a hint or a guess or can guess or I can give a hint? No? So zero gas, zero accidents, and zero ownership. Right? What happened here? Is that it? Okay. Thought I had another slide somewhere. Okay. So the mobility revolution is basically where we're heading, at least for some countries that have great infrastructure, that have, um, you know, the the uh, the, uh, the the ecosystem that can allow it. Um, um, to happen, and, uh, and um, earlier I talked about driver monitoring. The, one of the reasons why we do target driver monitoring is because um, it's a market that comes to us. Everybody is super excited about autonomous vehicles, and then there are two applications. When you have a car that can drive on its own sometimes, meaning it's quasi or semi-autonomous, uh, when a car is, is driven manually, you have the driver who's tired or can close their eyes. The car can respond accordingly. The steering wheel can vibrate if you're falling asleep. The car can also transition into autonomous mode, right? But then before it does, it needs to make sure that the person is, number one, present at the seat, paying attention, their eyes are open, they're looking at the windshield, they're not texting or talking to their, um, you know, um, passenger. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, similarly, when the car is in autonomous mode, but it hits an obstacle, there's a tree on the streets, there is, uh, you know, bad weather conditions that will prevent it from driving autonomously all the time. It generally takes about 10 seconds to hand over the driving operation to the driver, and that within that 10 seconds, that's when our software kicks in to look at the driver and uh, to make sure that they are uh, present, their eyes are open, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, if they are driving manually, the car can also transition back into autonomous. Uh, very important. So when this happens, we're going to achieve the triple zero or the, um, the uh, you know, zero ownership, zero accidents, and uh, zero consumption or zero, zero gas, right? Um, one of the slides that I don't find here, um, for some reason, is just about the state of the Moroccan startup. Uh, like I said earlier, I had the absolute pleasure of working with some of the startups and mentoring them, and I've seen probably a few dozen, a couple of dozens at least, uh, great ideas, etc. But a lot of them have very similar challenges. Some of them do have financial challenges, but the other, the other, some other ones have. Um, 
uh, red tape is what we call government challenges. They cannot bypass certain things. They will have to lobby. They need, they need you, the ministry, to help them with some programs and things like that, right? So I, uh, I, I, I did a little bit of homework uh, just over the last couple of days, and I came up with about four industries, four sectors that can benefit greatly today from, uh, from, 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 uh, from the disruption that the startups and the entrepreneurs can create. Number one is um, I was stuck yesterday, and I couldn't catch a cab, and it took me 30 minutes before I can take a cab. Transportation tech, right? Why are we waiting for Uber, which actually just got here for like three months ago, to become popular in both, you know, here and Rabat and all of the other cities? Why not some entrepreneurs just go ahead and start that piece of software, right? Just copy it, right? And beat Uber to it. Um, you know, you know the idea, it's validated. It's a $50 billion company, right? Uh, why not, right? Um, there is also some problems and, and challenges, rather, with uh, um, ag tech or agriculture tech, right? Uh, Morocco is mainly based on agriculture. It's an agriculture country. So there's a number of sensors, technologies that are uh, being developed uh, elsewhere that can be either cloned or utilized or, innovate, or can be like, in innovated and, and created here uh, from scratch, right? Uh, there is, for example, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, seed in uh, uh, processes uh, in order to eliminate wa waste, and, and there is all kinds of, of things. Uh, another problem that I realized is also uh, logistics for shipping, right? You ship something from overseas, and you kind of have 50-50 chance that it may make it. Uh, probably more than 50, but, um, you know, a lot of things get lost or do not get delivered for some reason. Um, there's a company out of the U.S. called SHIP, S-H-Y-P, that just competes with the post office and FedEx and UPS. So it's a, three young guys they do the same exact thing. They make sure that package gets delivered, right? It's not an address problem. It's probably a logistics problem. There's also FinTech, right? FinTech. Some, um, um, uh, some of the greatest... Um, startups uh, in, 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 in the U.S. Uh, that have made it big from PayPal to, um, you know, Coin to some other great companies, uh, you know, uh, create new novel technologies in fintech, right? Um, I understand the red tape, I understand the governments, I understand all of that, but, uh, you know, there is opportunity, and when there is opportunity, you should go for it. Nothing is easy. Entrepreneurship is easy. Waking up this morning and coming here at 9 or 10 in the morning is not easy either, right? So just keep trying. Just do it. Got it. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, I want to I wanna open it up for questions. We have about seven minutes for Q&A. Okay. Uh, please make it brief, quick. Ask your question briefly. Compose it in your head before you say it so that we can answer as many questions as possible. You can go ahead. Thank you. Don't be shy. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just present yourself and go ahead and ask. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was expecting to, three, three, to see three informations, uh, which I think are very important for people here in startups. So the first thing is, how did you come up with the IRS idea? How did you go from having the idea only to starting a company, going through the early stages, and then have becoming such a successful company? And the third thing, what were the major uh, challenges you had, and how did you overcome them? Yeah. Thank you very much. So, yeah, thank you. Great question. Number one, um, I got pulled into it, right? So remember I mentioned I have a background, consumer uh, behavioral measurement. Uh, 2008, we started a company. It's an advertising company. It was the first FTC compliant Facial recognition measured in-store TV network. Just like a fancy name for a bunch of TVs in airports and shopping malls that have a little camera connected to a computer. And that camera does in real time face and gen uh, Asian gender analytics and it broadcasts advertisements according to your gender. If you're within 10 feet or 15 feet or five meters, three meters, right? Um, from a display, you're walking towards it. It has a camera, it recognizes you as a male and it broadcasts a Gillette commercial for you because it knows you're a male. 
right? This is 2008, it was a bad time for advertising, but this is basically what led me to, uh, that was IRIS CV, this is what led me to IRIS, right? So 2011, we started a small R&D project. My co-founder, Stephen Kedavid, has a PhD at University of Miami, is basically uh, uh, you know, uh, obsessed with facial microexpressions and uh, uh, hired him as a consultant, uh, you know, uh, lived almost in Miami for, for, for one year, just commuting between Orlando and Miami, uh, and we put it together. Uh, the guy is brilliant and he knows exactly what, what we wanted and, uh, and he just built on top of what we, what we had, right? Um, we grew into a certain stage where we couldn't grow anymore. That was in Florida. Florida is not really techy and all of that. There's a lot of rednecks, sorry to say that. And then we, I had to move to Silicon Valley, right? So there's an ecosystem. Yesterday somebody asked me at the radio, you know, why, you know, what works in Silicon Valley doesn't work at, uh, elsewhere. It's an entire ecosystem. Your clients are all within five miles radius. You have a banker that helps you raise money. Um, you have banks like Silicon Valley banks that open a free bank account for you for two years. They work for you, literally. They can connect you with anybody you want. You have lawyers that give you, for example, a $10,000 to $15,000 of advance. You don't have to pay anything, really. Just go to the best law firm in Silicon Valley and tell them, I have a startup. Do you like my idea? Great. I don't have money. I'm going to owe you 15 grand, and I'm going to pay you in two years. So, so these are the things that really help you. Obviously, it's not easy. I'm not saying, I'm not, you know, probably I'm trying to, not trying to make it easy. It's not easy, right? Uh, rent is expensive, for example. You can't afford a, you know, two-bedroom uh, house. It's three grand, right, uh, or, or apartment. So, so it's not easy, but, but, but there is a price to pay for such a place, and that's, there is a reason why there is only... Uh, you know, one Silicon Valley in the world. So that model doesn't even work within the US, right? So this is a long answer to your question. It's a great question, it's actually three questions. But uh, yeah, thank you. Next question, please, do we have any time? Two minutes. We can answer two questions, go ahead. Uh, my name is Amin. Uh, I have only one question, it's about, uh, uh, do you think if you start this project from Morocco, would you have the same result? No, uh, not really. Good question. Uh, not really. So you do have to create problem, uh, products that solve local problems, right? Um, it's not a local problem. It's a futurist product anyways, even for the U.S., even for Asia, right? Um, uh, I would have probably created another product that would work for Morocco uh, if I wanted to stay in Morocco and only sell in Morocco. But a great question. We can answer one more question, please. Go ahead. Let's have a female. Go ahead. Your name, please. Okay. Very good question. Who do you work for? Okay. So we don't store data. Everything is processed in real time and shredded in real time. We cannot process data. It's, non, it's a non-privacy invasive product. Otherwise, we're going to have a lot of things. We can store data, of course, when people consent and say, yes, I'd like to turn my camera on and it's okay if you want to keep my video, but we don't want to keep those videos anyways. Otherwise, we're going to end up with like a city wide of like servers that are like bigger than, than, than YouTube and it's really pointless, right? So we need the data, not the video, not the mass storage, et cetera, et cetera. Are we good? Thank you guys very, very much. You have a great program ahead of you. Thank you so much. The planet. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Hi, uh, my name is Akram Ben Bark. I'm a, I, I work actually about five miles away from him, and uh, I would like to thank Startup Africa for giving me this opportunity to finally meet him. So I don't know how many years we've been close to each other, and uh, we meet uh, here at, uh, in Casablanca. Yeah. What a great way to, uh, to start uh, the day today. Can we give another round of applause for Modarty? Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Modar. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Okay. I think uh, Modar set the, the bar very high today with the, his concept, with, with the story he told. But uh, his story is a great segue for, uh, for the next panel session about uh, African entrepreneurs trying to go international. Can you go international? Are there opportunities in Africa? Um, this panel session will be uh, led by my good friend uh, Shafiq Sabiri, 
for those who don't know him, uh, he's the former uh, president and CEO of uh, HP CDG, uh, a large IT company here in the Morocco uh, with uh, 1,300 employees. He is a tech executive, but a, an, also uh, an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur at heart, actually. Uh, you see him in every single event here in, uh, in Morocco and abroad. Very involved in the MIT Global SAR Forum. Uh, active in the Kaufman Foundation. Actually, Shafiq has decided to leave HPCDG to start his own adventure. Without further ado, I would like to invite Shafiq to the stage. Where is he? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Do you remember me? Half an hour ago. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm very happy to be the moderator of this uh, roundtable about going international. I think uh, the guys I will introduce right, right now are, uh, have a successful story to share with us. And I ask them to join to tell us about their story and how are they successful abroad and how did they become. Uh, international. Uh, I would like to introduce first Asa Slimani. He's the head, founder and head of Paylogic. I'm asking Yasir Humam to join me, please. Founder and head of Cassiope. And last but not least, Tariq Fadli, Algo Consulting founder and CEO. Yes, he's very famous, yeah, we know. So thank you very much all to, for joining us. Please take your mics so we can make it efficient. <laughs> um, when we start a venture, when we start a new venture, we tend to focus on our uh, country to start our business, to sell in the country where we start the venture, when we, where we start the business, but sometimes it can be easier to start in some foreign countries, to start abroad. Um, then I think when you decide to go abroad, you will face challenges, you will seize opportunities. And in terms of uh, making business or in terms of uh, raising money, and these subjects uh, will be the, the guideline and roadmap for this uh, discussion today. So first of all, I would like each one please to introduce yourself, introduce your company, and tell us how did you get started and how uh, you became entrepreneur. So Isa first. Thank you, Shafir. Uh, my name is Isa Slimani. Uh, I'm general manager of a company called Paylogic, uh, which is uh, acting in the payment industry. Uh, we are mainly uh, software providers, for, software provider for uh, financial institutions, mainly bank. Uh, today we are present in around uh, 21 countries, and we are uh, providing our solutions for uh, 40 or 42 banks. Uh, uh, we started this business uh, nine years ago, starting from scratch, uh, by starting by a small dream th that is uh, changing the life of billion of African population. How can we impact their lives? This was the idea. I think that we'll have more chance to uh, explain you what uh, we have done exactly for this population. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nine years ago, he was a startup just like a lot of you today. Uh, Yasir, what about yourself? Uh, hello, uh, my name is Yasir. I'm the co-founder of Cassiope. We are. Could you please speak up, please? We are a um, software editor company. We started back in 2001. And the initial idea was to create value in Morocco by doing software engineering in Morocco for European projects. And so we did for the first seven years. And then we turned to the Moroccan market. 
Our first project that we won was against Sun Microsystems back in 2001. Uh, it was very tough, uh, but we had the opportunity to compete with the biggest, one of the biggest players by that time. And we had this first project, and then we had different other projects, mainly in Switzerland and France. And during all the 15 years, we continuously invested in R&D. Basically, almost 30 to sometimes 60 percent of our human resources are dedicated to R&D. And last two years, we turned to uh, be a software editor. So we have today a software solutions and basically one big uh, software solution that we think is uh, quite innovative and that today we are trying to sell all over the world and we're trying to go global with it. Well, great, thank you. What about you, Tarja? Um First of all, thank you for the uh, invitation. Uh, my name is Tarek. I uh, am part of uh, Algo Consulting that I founded eight years ago. Uh, we're now about 50 people. Uh, we started as a one-man show. Um, we started mainly as a Microsoft partner working in Morocco and um, throughout eight years uh, we worked in several projects uh, in Morocco and also uh, in North Africa. And uh, in the last three years we've been changing a little bit of strategy uh, to become more of uh, a solutions editor than a services provider. And um, this year we're uh, facing new challenges, uh, having to deal with, uh, with growth and expansion. And uh, we're heavily and aggressively trying to uh, target the African market. So. Okay, so you see, it's an evidence they are successful after eight, nine, ten years experience and growth. They have built a company that's is successful in Morocco and going more and more global. But sometimes it's not as easy as it looks 10 years after. Aisa, tell us about your first client, your first challenges when you just started your company. I'm just joking maybe uh, because you know more than uh, anyone how, how difficult it was. Before getting to my, our, my first customer, let me talk about my first prospect. So my first prospect was in uh, Comor, uh, Ireland. Uh, I took uh, three days flight going from Egypt to Yemen to Comor. And it cost me, I remember it very well, 4,200 US dollar. He was hungry. So, so this was the first cast of prospects that never been succeeded to get it. My first customer was in Sudan. Uh, why is in Sudan? Because uh, when we are trying to find our first customers, we have a very particular uh, uh, field where our customers are very few in each country. So we can only focus on 20 or we have only 20 or 30 potential customers, which are banks in each country. Maybe just a few words, uh, words about your business. Our what business, we are providing software for the bank uh, where you are doing uh, transaction on an item or on paying on internet on point of sale. It's a kind of our software which is managing this transaction to the bank. So you have a software that manages financial All the transactions. transactions for for example, maybe starting from the beginning of this uh, conference, uh, of this uh, uh, four, four minutes before, uh, our software should have managed around 30,000 US dollars, approvals of transactions within three or four minutes. Only. Okay, so we understand. Your clients are very few in every country. Exactly, exactly. So? With very few, already, most of them already equipped with other solutions. Okay, it means that we have potentially one or two customers each year with very big competition. Our competitors uh, came from Russia, 5,000 engineers from US, 7,000 engineers, and so. We are a very, very small company, and we are competing on the same deals. Wow. So we started in, in Sudan, why? Because uh, in Sudan, this kind of competitors can't be there. There is embargo, there is risk, wars, all that we know. 
So mainly, uh, sometimes when we are trying to find our first references, our first customers, we can just try to start by where it's the most easy to find it. Uh, and after 10 years, today, when we see our geographic location, uh, we are just comparing our geographic location to the 20, P, uh, 20 countries we are existing today, compare it to doing business reports in the world, we will find that we are present at 70% of the hardest countries where you can do business in the world. <laughs> this is not a risk, this is not a challenge, we consider it as an opportunity. And once we succeed in such markets, we can target the world. Wow. So I think you delivered a very, very good message to all of us because sometimes you have to, to go after the business uh, somewhere in the world where you were not born exactly. and seize the opportunity. The opportunity for you was Sudan because of the embargo, exactly. but then you could gain their confidence.